so much of our politics, so much of our debate is backward looking, when in fact, the future is now. If you think about the climate warming, it's happening. If you think about AI, you think about the ability for machines to learn at a pace that will far outstrip humanity, it's happening now. Yeah, and Wall Street and Washington, for sure, way behind, barely even speak the language. We're gonna have new ethical debates, new political debates, new business debates. All of these will be radically upended, and it's gonna require humanity to think at a pace we're not used to. Well, thanks for doing this. We really, really uh, appreciate it. And sure. I mean, just to sort of set the stage, uh, I think we sort of have your shared concern uh, about AI and about one, people not really understanding what it is, but also understanding sort of the, the potential consequences for humanity. Um, no problem. I might occasionally need to stop and check uh, for any emergencies coming through. Uh, that is Tesla. understood. <laughs> they said to happen, fortunately. Uh, a couple arrows stuck in my head. There you go. Sorry? What's that? I have Bolero stuck in my head. Oh. <laughs> uh, good. What's well, plunging? Okay. I mean, at the very basic, when you think, like, how should people think about artificial intelligence? Like, if you're going to explain it to one of your younger uh, children, you would say artificial intelligence is what? Uh, it's just digital intelligence, and um, as the algorithms and the hardware improve, that digital intelligence will exceed biological intelligence by a substantial margin. It's obvious. When you say that we'll exceed human intelligence, at some point soon, the machine's going to be smart, not just smarter, like exponentially smarter than any of us. Ensuring that the advent of AI is good, or at least we tried to make it good. Seems like a smart move. But we're way behind on that. Yes, we're not paying attention. We worry more about what, what name somebody called someone else than whether AI will destroy humanity. That's insane. Before we get, get to like solutions. And, and we're like children in a playground. This could be a huge problem for society. What are the scenarios that scare you most? Humanity really is not evolved to think of existential threats in general. We're involved to think about things that are very close to us, near term, to, to be upset with other humans, and, and not, not to really to think about things that could destroy humanity as a whole. Um, but then in recent decades, recent, just really in the last century, we had nu nuclear bombs, which are, could potentially destroy civilization, obviously. Uh, we have AI, which could destroy civilization. Uh, we have global warming, which could destroy civilization, or, or at least severely disrupt uh, civilization. Um, Excuse me, how could AI mm -hmm. destroy civilization? You know, it would be something in the same way that humans destroyed the habitat of primates. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be destroyed, but we might be relegated to a small corner of the world. When Homo sapiens became much smarter than other primates, I pushed all the other ones into small habitats. They were just in the way. Could an AI, even in this moment, just with the technology that we have before us, be used in some fairly destructive ways? You could make a swarm of assassin drones for very little money by just taking the, the, the face ID chip that's used in cell phones and uh, having a small explosive charge and a, and a standard drone and have them just do a grid sweep of the building until they find the person they're looking for, ram into them and, ex and explode. You can do that right now. No extra, no new technology is needed right now. People just think this stuff is of, of sci-fi novels and movies and it's so far away. But yeah. every time I hear you speak, it's like, well, no, this stuff is sitting, it's, it's right here. Probably a bigger risk than, than being hunted down by a, a drone is that uh, AI would be used to make incredibly effective propaganda. Uh, that would not seem like pro propaganda. So these are deep fakes. Yeah, influence the direction of society influence elections, artificial intelligence, just 
hones the message, hones the message, check, looks, at the feed, looks at the feedback, makes this message slightly better. But within milliseconds, it, could, it can um, adapt this message and, and shift and react to news. And, and there's so many uh, social media accounts out there that are n not people. Like, how do, you, how do you know it's a person, not a person? One reason that regulators and others are a little bit in denial about this is the speed, the pace of change. What is the consequence of that speed of change? The way in which a regulation is put in place is slow and linear. Right. And we are facing an exponential threat. And if you, if you have a linear response to an exp exponential threat, it's quite likely the exponential threat will win. That, in a nutshell, is the issue. You're a neuroscience company, and you're working to build basically an interface to the brain. Yeah. Electrode to neuron interface at a mic micro level. OK, what is that? Like, I'm going to have like a plug in my head that's going to fit into mm -hmm. a hard drive? Like, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. Ch a chip and a bunch of tiny wires. This, this would be implanted surgically. And it would do what? Could you input? Could you download Jim? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, wait, wait, <laughs> the long-term aspiration with Neuralink was, would be to achieve a symbiosis with uh, artificial intelligence um, and to achieve a sort of democratization of, of intelligence uh, such that it is not monopolistically held in a purely digital form by governments and, and large corporations. Basically, an effort for man to merge with machine in yes. a healthy way. Yes. To beat machines, you basically have to merge with machines. Most likely, yes. Essentially, how do we ensure that the future constitutes the, the sum of the will of humanity? Um, and so if we have billions of people with a high bandwidth link to the AI extension of themselves, it would actually make everyone hyper smart. OK, so you so This is very esoteric. Yeah, no, but you say this is more psi than phi. So you believe we're headed this I way. I believe this can be done. When will I be able to get the interface implant? It's probably on the order of a decade. And by the way, you, you kind of have this already in, in a weird way in that you have uh, a digital tertiary layer in the form of your phone, your, your computers. You basically have this, these computing devices that form a, a tertiary layer on your cognition already. So wait, we have that imprint in our brain, uh, implant in our brain. Yeah. We download most of Jim. Then could I, in the digital Jim, yes. could I make him a skilled Mandarin speaker or a mm -hmm. tuba player yes. and re-upload it to him? Yeah. It, it, along the way, uh, Neuralink is going to help solve a lot of uh, nerve, nerve problems. Like so, uh, in fact, we're just talking about, OK, what would it take to uh, really solve for uh, spinal cord injuries. We already know how to do this. Uh, implant electrodes into the motor cortex of the brain um, and then bypass the, the severed section of the, of the spine and have uh, effectively local microcontrollers near the muscle groups. It could restore full limb functionality. Very exciting what can be done here. And, and it's just memory. Like, as people get older, they lose their memory. And so saying it's like, it's incredibly sad when a mother forgets her children. Um, and that can be solved too. I've seen you speak in person. We've watched some of your interviews. Like sometimes you seem visibly sad about what's happening. I think we should try to take the set of actions that are most likely to make the future good for humanity. I'm pro. I'm pro human. Um, and my faith in humanity has been a little shaken this year, uh, but I'm still pro humanity. You've said that this has been the toughest year for you, the most sort of taxing yeah. year for you. Like why? Well, I mean Tesla really faced a severe. A uh, threat, threat of death uh, due to the Model 3 production ramp. Essentially, the, the company was bleeding money like crazy, and, and just if, if we didn't solve these problems in a very short period of time, uh, we would die. Uh, and it was extremely difficult to solve them. How close to death did you come? We, you know, within single digit weeks. 22 hours a day? Or like what, how many hours? I was working, yeah, so seven days a week, sleeping in the factory. Uh, I worked everywhere from the, I worked in the, I worked in the paint shop. General Assembly, body shop. You ever worry about yourself imploding? Like it's just yeah, too yeah. much? Absolutely. No one should put this many hours into work. This is not good. And people should not work this hard. I'm not, they should not do this. This is too, it's very painful. Painful in what sense? Uh, it's, it, hurts my, it hurts my brain and my heart. It hurts. This is not recommended for anyone. I just did it because if I didn't do it, then Tesla, good chance Tesla would die.
Do you believe in God? I believe, I believe there's some, there's some explanation for this universe, which you might call God. Elon Musk, thank you for an amazing conversation. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, sir. Help you guys uh, with that loading. Um, so, thank you. Uh, very, very My name is Sarah Kane, and I did not vote for Hillary or Trump. I tend to be more independent. Um, as of late, I find myself leaning more Democratic. We've both been Democrats for years, and we switched over this last election to Republicans. Our views are aligned with that more than anything else. So. I'm not a registered voter. I'm not either. I'm 65 years old, and I'm a registered Republican. This time around, I'm Democrat, let's just say that. We're red, yellow, black, and white. We're Democrat, Republican. We're young, we're old, we're fat, we're skinny. We're all these things, but we together make up the what? The body of Christ. And that's more important than any political affiliation or anything else that we see in this world, is it not? The common perception is evangelicals are a monolithic entity politically, but they're not. And you see these divides especially among African-American evangelicals, Hispanic evangelicals, and it's a generational shift. But what's changed in the last 15 to 20 years? We're becoming more extremist on both sides. I'll tell you, I want to give you a good idea this week. If you're a Republican, I want you to tweet three positive things about the Democrats. And if you're a Democrat, I want you to tweet three positive things about the Republicans. Amen? How many of you will do that with me? Just say amen. amen. Boy, it's awful quiet this morning. <laughs> I had to leave my prior church because they were trying to say who you should vote for. I'm like, I don't want to jump on a bus to go see Rick Perry, and me and my family shouldn't have to. America was founded upon bringing in all different types of cultures and views and walks of life, and that's really what made mm -hmm. this a, a, a strong country foundationally. Frankly, I didn't think about that stuff as much as when I came to Northwood and we started having these conversations, and I, I realize I empathize, and I realize that, you know, they're looking through it through a different lens. And the changes that we want to bring about as a church come about as Jesus lives inside of us. And people say, that's what it means to follow Jesus. They're not driven by fear. They're not driven by hate. Those people love everybody. Amen. They worship together. You know, what keeps me up at night is that we have traded the gospel for Caesar. We've now let politicians and money and power determine what we see as right and wrong. And that's, that's what I worry about. There's been a lot of discussion as to how Donald Trump won the election. I believe it was God. God showed up. He answered the prayers of hundreds of thousands of people across this land that have been praying for this country. Alexi McCammon, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Alexi. How are Welcome. you? I'm doing good. Welcome. We're going to go back here for the interview. Okay. All right, now down this hall. And then um, these are just um, some of the pictures. This is a... Uh, and my father was lying in honor at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. The president invited the family to come over and have dinner with him that night. Wow. Then um, just people that we've worked with over the years. I want to talk about the church and the future of the church. There are studies and research out there that shows that church membership is declining across all religious spectrums. Why do you think that is? In this country, 
We have seen uh, in the last uh, 70 years uh, liberalism in churches. And th those churches, those denominations, a lot of that has, membership has gone down as people have left. Uh, but churches that teach the Bible, believe the Bible, are doing well. So you mentioned liberalism. Mm -hmm. Do you think liberals are evil? No. We're all guilty of breaking God's standards and laws, and it's called sin. And his laws and his standards don't change with public opinion. God doesn't take a poll uh, to see uh, whether he's popular or not. Are you ever worried about the Christian faith becoming too associated, too closely associated with partisan politics or the Republican Party? Well, first of all, I'm going to support politicians that are going to support the Christian faith, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, independents, politicians that, that are going to guarantee my freedom of worship. And I appreciate the president has appointed now two conservative judges that are going to defend religious freedom. So amen to that. I'm curious if you worry about your support of him and what that might say to folks within your church if it is viewed as you supporting someone who exploits women. I think we have to look at a person where they are today. President Trump uh, has admitted his faults and um, has apologized to his wife and his daughter for things that he has done and said. And he has to stand before God for those things. And so you think that he has expressed regret with regards to those allegations specifically? <laughs> yeah. Now people say, well, Frank, how can you defend him when he's lived such a sordid life? I never said he was the best example of the Christian faith. <laughs> he defends the faith. And I appreciate that uh, very, very much. So Cliff Sims, I think, is one of the most interesting people you've never heard of. When Cliff Sims worked in the White House, his title was Director of Message Strategy. Why did he really matter? Well, his title was irrelevant. He actually wasn't a senior, particularly senior person in there. But Trump liked him, and he was, as one senior official said to me, not in a positive way, he was in rooms he was not supposed to be in. The stories Cliff tells are the kinds of stories we hear when we go and have an off-the-record dinner or an off-the-record drink with a, with a White House official. He's just got the stones to say it on camera. <laughs> I would think one thing that people don't really understand is there are all these people that are not household names that actually see a lot more of the president than anyone realizes. You were also someone who was in the Oval a lot. What's it like in there with Trump? Like, during the day when he's absorbing information, watching TV, like, just, what's the picture? I had the opportunity to, to work with Trump in one of his, like, most intimate settings, which is anytime he's recording videos. And so the way I could tell the progression of my relationship with, with the president was, you know, he always asks, in a video setting, the person that he trusts the most, what they think about what he said. And it was like, Hope, what do you think about that? Or Keith Schiller would be there. Keith, what do you think about that? And over, and at some point it was Cliff, what do you think about that? And that's when I realized that he at least trusted me on some level. And so you have an opportunity to decide whether or not you want to say, what if you said it this little different way? So yeah, he is totally open to give me a good tweet, give me a good something, you know, way to say this in this video. Uh, yeah, he's in anything communications-wise, he's open to ideas. I think Twitter is, in some ways, his most effective tool. Have you ever been with Trump when he's tweeting? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've heard he both types out the tweet and dictates the Yeah, tweet. I think the, the settings that I've been with him is usually the 
dictation. And he's meticulous. He's meticulous with like, not just the words that he wants to use, but the punctuation. And so he'll, you know, he'll say, you know, Jonathan Swan at Axios is an awful, terrible reporter, dash, dash, capital S, capital A, capital D, exclamation (laughs) point. And there's also a process in the White House by which you can submit tweets. Have you ever submitted a tweet? Oh yeah, I mean, in the White House, I had a difficult time writing in my own voice because I had written so much in Donald Trump's voice. And so people would started bringing their policy issues to me so that I could craft a, a Trumpian tweet. Cause he's not gonna put out a lame tweet. If a tweet doesn't get any retweets, that's a fail. But I do think that he's very cognizant of the power that he has through that to set the, the media narrative. And I have seen him talk about something that he wants to tweet, ultimately tweeting whatever that thing is within literally a minute. Reporters are now retweeting his tweet with their own comments on top of it. He goes into the private dining room and within about five minutes, he can see this creation, this, that he is, you know, this thing that he has created, how it's playing out on the television. And um, he wants CNN to freak out. He gets to say, look at these lunatics out there. They're so disconnected from middle America. It gives him an opportunity to build a bond with his people because he's like, we're in this together against these people. So he's like, great. He loves watching them freak out. For people on the outside, they read reports that, you know, it's a viper's nest, et cetera, et cetera. How accurate, like, was your experience of that? So I think there were some fatal flaws going into the White House that led to a lot of the the infighting that has become so famous, infamous now. The transition was an unmitigated disaster. You had a, a built-in frustration from some people who were on the campaign about people that they viewed as, as people that were trying to stop Donald Trump from getting elected, who they were suddenly subordinated to when they came into the White House. This is a West Wing filled with people who are not Trump people. Certainly a lot of folks there that are not Trump people. And they looked at all of us as just a bunch of idiots that uh, didn't know what we were doing. And the trust broke down to such a degree that um, it was the single most toxic working environment that I have ever experienced by far. There was a scientific study that was done where they put two rats in water. One of the rats, after a little while, they took it out for a few seconds and they dropped it back in there. And that rat was able to swim for hours longer Hmm. than the other one. The other one drowned. And the reason is quite simply hope that he would be plucked out of that and would maybe have a chance to survive. For me, interacting with the president was like getting plucked out of the water that I get to have an opportunity that I'll never have again in my life probably to to have conversations with the most powerful person on the planet to impact who knows what in who knows what ways. Like, how influential is he on climate? Most people know him as uh, the billionaire who founded Microsoft. I know him as a climate change advocate and somebody who is a big investor in new energy technologies. But also, he has the ear of the people that matters. He spent a lot of time with President Trump, and yet the president has basically said no to everything that Bill Gates and others have said we desperately need to do. You're having more urgency about climate change from you know average people on the street. And then in addition to that, you have private companies and philanthropists and leaders like Bill Gates. And then eventually you'll see that influence the politics. Thank you. Bill. Great to see you again. Good to see you. Hi, Hi. Amy Harder. Great to meet you? you. You've been sounding the alarm on climate issues for a really long time. You've always been optimistic that 
the combination of technology and action could avert a lot of the worst consequences. But it seems like a lot of things are not headed in the right direction. Are you still optimistic? Well, I am optimistic. Part of the problem is that there's not a broad awareness on how challenging it's going to be to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. There's a lot of focus on wind and solar power. And Tesla, for example, gets so many headlines. But do you think those types of technologies and offshoots of them can solve the problem? A lot of people think, OK, renewable energy, wind and solar has gotten a lot cheaper. Isn't that it? Well, electricity is only a quarter of the problem. In fact, we've got to solve the entire 100%. You know, unless somebody has the pie in, in their mind that, OK, electricity is 25%, agriculture is 24%, transport's 14%. Unless they start with that, we're not really talking about the same problem. Is it not resonating with business leaders that this is really an economic opportunity, not just a national necessity and a global necessity? It's very American to invent things to help the entire world. We're always in the front of new science and new product development. So it would be tragic if this was the first time the U.S. didn't didn't play that role. Is private action um, by people like yourselves, is that going to be enough? Not unless there's an incredible amount of innovation. And so we're very far away from getting all these sources down to zero, which is what we have to do to solve this problem. You're 47. What is the likelihood that you personally will go to Mars? 70%. I know exactly what to do. We've recently made a number of breakthroughs that, I, that I'm just really fired up about. And when does that happen? In our lifetimes? Yeah, yeah. Let's say the first light is in seven years. I'm talking about moving there. So it's like, so if it, if you get the price ticket maybe around a couple hundred thousand dollars. An escape hatch for rich people? No. Your probability of dying on Mars is much higher than Earth. Really, the app going to Mars would be like Shackleton's app going to the Antarctic. It's going to be hard. Uh, there's a good chance of death, going in a little can through deep space. But you might land successfully. Once you get there, you'll be working nonstop to build the base. So you have not much time for leisure. But even after doing all this, uh, there's a very harsh environment, so there's a good chance you die there. And uh, we think you can come back, but we're not sure. Now, does that sound like an escape hatch for rich people? And yet you would unhesitatingly go. It's dangerous, but you know, there's lots of people like climb mountains. You know why they climb mountains? Because people die on, on Everest all the time. They like doing it for the challenge. <laughs>